Thank you, Carol. Um, and welcome. Thank you so much for, for, for coming out, out here this evening. Um, I want to first start off by thanking NYU Abu Dhabi and specifically the staff and leadership at the NYU AD Institute for hosting and supporting the public event tonight, as well as the inclusion workshop that will be held over the next two days. We're very excited um, for all of this to unfold in the next couple days. I also want to thank Her Excellency, Dr. Raba El Samati, for her opening remarks and her support of the ongoing and expanding collaborations between the Ministry of Education and NYU Steinhardt not only around inclusion, but also other areas of education. We share the common goal of improving educational outcomes and teacher and school leader professional training in the UAE. Before I introduce our keynote, I want to give special mention to our 15 students that I've had the pleasure of meeting um, this past week who are with us for our three-week week January or J term. You guys want to raise your hand? They're all sitting together. Um, they hear this a lot, but I'm just still amazed. There are 15 students representing 15 countries. And they're learning about the power of inclusion and shifting their perspective to a strength-based, rights-based model. And if you think about where in the world they're from, the impact of taking that knowledge back to their, to their countries is, is just powerful and it's magnified by their, by their presence here. Along with young, empowered self-advocates like Fatma al Jassim, I'm going to point out, if you want to raise your hand, um, she, she came and talked with our... She came, she came and talked with our class, and I think I can say, and I can speak for the students, that she blew us all away by her information and her knowledge and her passion and her commitment. It's people um, of determination, like Fatma, who is here tonight, that really will begin to change perceptions around disability. You know, I am considered an expert in inclusion, but I'm not the expert in inclusion. It's people of determination that are the experts around inclusion, around policy. They know what they need. They know what works. They just need a chance to be, to be heard. So, um, without, so on that note, I'm really happy to introduce our keynote speaker, um, who you'll see as an incredible expert, activist, and communicator. And I'm going to read his bio, because it's just wonderful. Um, Lawrence Carter Long has been on the front lines of popular culture and social change since the age of five, when he was the poster child for a disability-related charity campaign. As an adult, Lawrence's unique blend of public policy, popular culture, and personality has been awarded by the likes of former New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg and the American Association of People with Disabilities. In a career path that could really span multiple lifetimes, Lawrence has been, are you ready? A modern dancer, a radio show host, a producer, and a public servant. A lifelong cinephile, in 2012, Lawrence curated and co-hosted the groundbreaking festival, The Projected Image, A History of Disability on Film, on Turner Classic Movies that reached 87 million people. Formerly the public affairs specialist for the National Council on Disability, the independent federal agency that brought us the Americans with Disabilities Act in Washington, DC, he now works as the director of communications for the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund in Berkeley, California, and spearheads their Disability and Media Alliance project. In his communications and media work, Lawrence has been interviewed by respected outlets like USA Today, Associated Press, The New York Times, The Daily Show, the BBC, and CNN, among notable sources in a variety of topical areas, including media representation, inclusion, and disability history. Lawrence, I'd like to welcome you to give our keynote. Thank you, Professor Koenig. And uh, thank you, Her Excellency, and Carol, Associate Dean, everyone with NYU Abu Dhabi, the fantastic students back there. Fatma, um, it's my pleasure to be here. It's my first time here, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the conference and, and um, to everything. Um, um, it's been a great trip so far. So you can tell by that bio, um, um, I've done a few things. Uh, um, I really just can't keep a job. Um, um, and all of those things, all of those factors, are really what have informed me in the work that I do. Um, the title of the talk is From Diagnosis to Identity, How Changing Ideas About Disability Are Putting Community First. And I think this is a really ripe a topic for the educa education equity leading the inclusion revolution. So what are we talking about when we say the disability community? Well, it depends on who you ask. Talk about numbers, 
It's an estimated one billion people in the world have a disability. That's with a B, one billion. That's 15% of the world's population. Um, uh, disability prevalence is higher for some developing countries. Um, one fifth of the estimated global total, or between 110 million and 190 million, people experience significant disabilities. If you ask other people, right, who, what are we talking about when we say the disability community? You might hear something about what's called the medical model of disability. Now, this is probably still the most common notion, idea about disability in the world. Under the medical model of disability, people are broken by their impairments and their differences, or they're what's considered to be a deficit. Disability is always something that is meant to be fixed, cured, or corrected. The medical model fo focuses on what is imagined to be wrong with the individual, rather than addressing changes that need to be made in society. Another thing the medical model does, which I think is really important and doesn't get talked about enough, it fosters low expectations, leads to lost opportunities for independence, and for innovation in a person's life, and I think worse yet, in society at large. And we're gonna see exactly how that plays out in just a little bit. But if you're only defined from most people as one thing, right? They're not seeing the complete person, the total person. You could say, for example, right? I grew up in rural Indiana in the United States in farm country, right? So depending on who you are, you could call me a hick or a hillbilly. Right? That would be correct. Um, you could also say that I'm a vegetarian, also correct. You could say that I'm a Buddhist, also correct. You could say that I've been a modern dancer, correct, right? But if you isolate any one of those things, right, and just look at that alone, then you miss the totality of who I am, of all those different things. And the same is true for people around the world. There is a competing model of disability, though, and that is what we call the social model of disability. Now, the social model of disability asserts that disability is caused by a lack of foresight, planning, or consideration, rather than a person's physical, mental, or sensory condition. It focuses on removing barriers. These could be both attitudinal, how people think about disability, or structural, whether or not there's a ramp going into the building, whether or not somebody who is deaf gets a sign language interpreter, whether or not somebody who's blind gets something in Braille. The, that, and all those things, right, excuse the omission of disabled people from education, employment, and other aspects of everyday life. When these barriers are removed, people with disabilities can be independent and they can be equal in society with their own choices and control over their own lives, doing their part to contribute to the greater good, right, by focusing on the society. Disabled people developed the social model of disability to address the experiences, the expertise, and the insights that have been ignored by the more traditional medical model as a way to facilitate a more holistic, inclusive, and innovative, I would say, ways of being. What are we talking about when we talk about the disability community? Another thing that's very common, and this is in the media work that I do, whether I'm talking to a producer, a director, a reporter, an editor, Time and time again, in the news stories that are written about people with disabilities from around the world, there's this notion of overcoming disability. So in order, the, the idea is this, in order for people with disabilities to be respected or even considered worthy or valuable, they have to perpetually work to overcome their disabilities. They've got to strive to be normal. What does that mean? That means not being disabled, right? which is impossible. Could you imagine someone saying, now Lawrence, don't be a man, right? I can't do it, I'm a guy, that's how I am, right? So 
that's impossible. You're set up to fail. And while few things are certain in life, this notion of overcoming disability, that framing disability or looking at disability as a deficit will set anybody up for failure. Success, according to this model, this notion is not determined by one's achievements, by their skills, by their talents, but rather by the disabled person's desire to become like non-disabled people. Right? This is, of course, by definition, the only thing that people with disabilities can do. Historically, people, uh, people with disabilities have been expected to pursue a normality that will forever elude them. We've been expected to embark on a futile quest by dangling an over-elusive carrot of social acceptance that most, if not all, will never be able to obtain. So I push back against this notion. How do we get here? Well, historically, people with disabilities have, been, have had to battle against centuries of biased assumptions, harmful stereotypes, and fear. In the 1800s, for example, in the States, people with disabilities were considered tragic, pitiful individuals. Have you heard that before? Is that a notion that seems common? Unfit or unable to contribute to society, except maybe to be ridiculed as objects of entertainment in circuses and exhibitions. Disabled people have been assumed to be abnormal and feeble-minded, routinely forced into sterilization against their will, and often without their knowledge. Been forced into institutions and asylums where people have spent their entire lives. This was called purification. Segregation of disabled people was considered merciful, but ultimately it kept people with disabilities invisible, isolated, and hidden from an often fearful, biased society. In the States, the social status of disabled people began to shift a little bit after World War I, when veterans with disabilities uh, expected that the United States government provide rehabilitation in exchange for their service to the nation. In the 30s, the United States saw the introduction of many advancements in technology, as well as government assistance, things like Social Security, contributing to the self-reliance and self-sufficiency of people with disabilities. We'd see posters like this one that says, the Red Cross is spending $10 million a year to help the disabled ex-serviceman and his family Right? You've got a guy there who's an amputee using a cane because of his service to the war effort was seen as somebody who was valuable or worthy. A little bit after that, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, he was called, served as the 32nd president of the United States from 1933 until his death in 45. Now, FDR advocated for the rehabilitation of people with disabilities but still operate under the idea that a disability was abnormal or shameful and should be cured or fixed. This is the only photograph that we've been able to verify of FDR using his wheelchair since he had polio himself. In the 40s and 50s, disabled World War II veterans placed increasing pressure on government to provide them with rehabilitation and vocational training. And World War II veterans made disability issues more visible to a country of thankful citizens who were concerned for long-term welfare of, of young men who sacrificed their lives to secure the safety of the United States. Again, the sign says America needs all of us, and it shows a uh, man with a prosthetic, an amputee, working at a new job, gaining, gaining a skill, and it says hire the handicapped through the State Employment Service local agency. How many of you have seen this photograph before, or this image before? Good old Uncle Sam calling on patriotism and nationalism, saying that he wants you for the US Army. Again, playing into these notions, right? Forget me not. Looking at service, but also saying that if you've become disabled, right, and you were not before, forget me not, you become an object of pity. Or you become a recipient of charity, playing into that medical model. Now, this notion of the disabled soldier began to shift in the 1950s. Right? You still see the soldier kind of there in the background, but in the front, in the foreground, you see a disabled child now using crutches, and it says, this fight is yours, join the March of Dimes. This continued on into the 50s. Your dimes did this for me, join the March of Dimes. You notice that the child is walking. In this poster, look, I can walk again, join the March of Dimes. 
again, reinforcing that notion that disability is something to be fixed, cured, or corrected. This continued on. Remember this guy, Uncle Sam? It wasn't too long until we got this guy, Jerry Lewis. Now, Jerry Lewis had been a comedian in TV and film, and he began as the host for what was a fundraising telethon on TV for about three decades. Instead of needing somebody for public service, he needs you to fight muscle diseases. Same pose. A penny buys a lot of hope, right? And there you see the disabled child in the background. Give your pennies, give hope for this broken child. You see Jerry Lewis there beside John Fitzgerald Kennedy in the Oval Office of the White House. This went to the very top, these ideas, these notions, even though Kennedy himself had a disabled sister. Now, we're moving forward into the 1970s. What is this image? You see the conditions in an institution. A watershed case in the evolution of the legal rights of people with disabilities to live in dignity arose out of public awareness of the horroric, oh, horrific, I'm sorry, conditions under which children and adults with disabilities were living in places like the Willow Brook State uh, De Developmental Center in New York State. This case set important precedents for the humane and ethical treatment of people with developmental disabilities living in institutions. And in turn, it served as the catalyst for accelerating the pace of community placements, getting people out of institutions and into the community, expanding community services, increasing the quality of day programs, and establishing the right of people, of children with disabilities to a public education. No longer segregated, no longer isolated, in schools with their non-disabled peers. Again, from Willowbrook, this photograph, following a television expose, parents of Willowbrook, residents filed a clash action lawsuit in the US District Court in uh, New York on March 17, 1972. The lawsuit alleged that conditions at Willowbrook violated the constitutional rights of the residents. So this was happening right about the same time the UAE was formed, right? To put it into historical context about how recent this was. Again, People in the conditions, they were shocked when this expose went out. Eventually, Willowbrook was closed. It was called the Department of Mental Hygiene. That's what it was known as. That's where people were kept. They were supposed to administer the care and take care of, make sure people got their needs met, mental hygiene, right? This is before something that was called the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, which was later named the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, was enacted in 75. Public schools before then had only accommodated one in five children with disabilities. And by the time that IDA was enacted, more than one million children in the US had no access to the public school system. So there was work yet to do. The signs say, two disabled children who are using wheelchairs. One says, I'm in a mainstream school. The other kid says, why am I not in a mainstream school? Good question. Also in 1972, a young kid by the name of Lawrence in rural Indiana was selected to be a poster child for a fundraising charity. As a young kid, this was an exciting job. People carried me around. They had me walk out in front of people, fundraisers, people with checks. And I would say to those folks, thanks to you, it's working. Thanks to you, I'm walking. Much like those posters in the 1950s, right? They get out their checks. <laughs> I would smile. And I would be done with my job. I didn't much think about it when I was five years old, but it did plant a seed. On into the 70s, the civil rights movement for people of color, for women, had happened in the United States. People with disabilities in places like New York City, Disabled in Action, DIA, three words, not two, um, began fighting and advocating for their rights. You can see here voter registration for people with disabilities had begun, knowing that if they wanted their voices to be heard, if they wanted their needs to be met or their interests to be considered, 
we also had to be voting. These were for basic things, right? You've heard of the American Civil Rights Movement. People were forced to sit in the back of the bus. They refused to sit in the back of the bus. Some people were arrested for that. Folks with disabilities couldn't even get on the bus. Right? That's the difference, right? These signs say lips, not lies. Freedom Rider, buses are for everyone. So this continuing into the 1980s, the American flag rallies disabled people no longer in isolation or alone in institutions, but living in the community, coming together to say, if we band together, if we rally together, if we come together, we can get those needs met. We will be a force to be reckoned with. They rallied in every state across the United States, met, organized, came together, called their senators, their elected representatives, and eventually, when it looked like the Americans with Disabilities Act wouldn't pass, decided that they would climb the stairs of the United States Capitol. A symbolic gesture to say, we can't access your building, but we're not giving up. Maybe the first people of determination. I'm not sure. This also shows um, that action, climbing the stairs of the United States Capitol, got people's attention, and eventually the law was passed in 1990. So advocacy, eventually, what did that mean? The evolution of advocacy. You gave us your dimes, the sign says. Now we want our rights, right? Signs of progress throughout this time, right? Before people were advocating, if you used a wheelchair, there was no ramp. There was no curb cut. You had to take your chances getting into the street, knowing that you may not be able to get out of the street. I could be stuck there waiting for incoming traffic. Somebody, you might have to wait on a kind soul to help you. Pop the chair back, give you a little boost so you could get onto the curb, right? Advocacy changed that. Activism changed that. People coming together changed that. Who benefits from inclusion? Now, it's obvious you can see this picture, right? Wheelchair, there's a curb cut. So people with disabilities, yes, that's obvious. But who else benefits from inclusion? Think of those curb cuts, the most basic accommodation that you can get. Who else gains from that? Well, what about people with luggage, right? With the wheels. How many of you have used a curb cut, right, while taking your suitcase? You have people with disabilities to thank for that, right? Who else? People with baby strollers, mothers, the infants, right? The infants are happy too. They're not getting bounced along the curb like they used to be. Who else? This guy <laughs> <laughs> on his skateboard, right? Makes getting to and from wherever you want to go a heck of a lot easier. But we're not done yet. Who else? That's right. In New York City in particular, where I've spent uh, most of my adult life, you've got the hot dog vendors, right? Who wouldn't be able to park on that curb if it weren't for those curb cuts. And once you can maybe graduate from the older carts to the new carts, right? Yeah, that continues. Imagine trying to get this thing up and down off the curb in traffic, in New York City traffic. They don't have to do that anymore. The bottom line is that who benefits from inclusion? Everyone benefits from inclusion. Signs of progress. If you heard the story just in the last couple days, the bride display um, with the uh, in the wheelchair, right? You know, that has gone viral. I've seen it every news feed that I've been going on today, right? The woman who put the shop together, the display artist said, mobility aids are often portrayed as negative things. People want to hide when mobility aids like wheelchairs give us freedom. That shows you the cognitive dissonance, the disconnect between those who use something like a wheelchair and the imagination, the assumptions that people have about wheelchairs. I prefer to call wheelchairs chariots of independence, right? because it helps people get where they want to go. Right? That's exactly what they do. And this is a sign of that, I think. It shows that if that's reaching the popular culture, and the artist didn't even think twice about that, didn't expect there to be an uproar, 
didn't expect it to go viral. It was just normal to her. I think it shows how far we've come. Wait, we're not done yet, right? Foster an inclusive understanding. Inclusion is more, right, than warm, fuzzy words, right? There's an internet meme, popular internet meme right here. It says, see the person, not the disability. Now, on the surface, that might seem like a very nice thing, right? But what are the implications of that way of thinking? What are the consequences of that way of thinking? Would we say, see the person, not the gender? Would we say, see the person, not the ethnicity? Would we say, see the person, not the religion? Probably not. If we say, see the person, not the disability, we allow for this. This is what happens when you see the person, not the disability. You give people an excuse to not provide the accommodation. You give people a reason to not be inclusive. So what is the best way forward, right? Well, I would say this, see both. It's that simple. See both. See the person and the disability. Provide the accommodation. Learn from the innovation, right? And change your expectations. For most of human history, disability was just a diagnosis. That was the only option. That was the only thing you got. People fought back. They banded together. And they decided they got active and engaged in advocacy. And if you talk to people around the world about what disability means to them now, what you're more likely to hear back is not the word diagnosis. You'll hear words like identity, history, constituency, community. By any definition, that's progress. Why is education equity important? And I'll close with these thoughts. Well, one, because disabled children grow up, right? You have that opportunity throughout school to set the foundation for what that child can be and what that child can do as an adult. It is of the utmost importance to begin with a strong foundation. That brings a responsibility, and that responsibility is yours. Also, people deserve equal opportunities to what? Travel, laugh, hang out, have fun with their families, go out with friends, hang 10, enjoy nature, fall in love, imagine, graduate, that's me. Represent, also me. Sing, that's me. Dance, yep, you guessed it. Inform, entertain, advocate, travel. That's the newest slide, by the way. That was Sedan <laughs> at the Grand Mosque. Just like everybody else. So I told you a little story earlier about being a poster child, being five years old, right? And when I was five, I didn't walk till I was five. I had three different surgeries. My mother was a single parent. As you could guess, as I was learning to walk, I fell down a lot. My mother had two responses, two reactions to me falling down. Her first reaction would be, are you OK? And usually I would answer, yes, I'm fine. And then she would reply, OK, then, get up. Right? Now, there were people who thought that that was cruel. There are people who thought that that was mean. But as I look back now as an adult, I find that that willingness to let me fall down right, and to give me a push to say, find your way back up, 
was instrumental. If I leave you with any thought, it would be let that guide your work. Let it propel you forward. Not because people need to be fixed, because we're not broken. Disability is a normal part of the human experience. If you live long enough, whether by incident or accident, or just plain old age, you'll be lucky enough to join the club. But you shouldn't wait that long. You shouldn't wait until it affects you to create an inclusive society. Be a person of determination. What do I mean by that? Well, I think in order for phrases like person of determination to matter, to work, you have to set the right expectations. To be determined, right? There has to be an element of failure. You have to have the dignity of risk, the possibility of something not working out. A person who is never allowed to fall down will never learn how to pick themselves back up again. That's the most important skill you can teach anyone. We can't, can't coddle people or protect them from everything. We have to provide them with the skills to survive and to thrive. This is the amazing thing about disability. I had not been a disability advocate. I had not worked in disability advocacy until I was 35 years old. I had that brief step when I was five. People fought. They got the ADA. They don't need me. I'll go on with my life. I'll do media. I was wrong there. I was wrong. There is a place for everyone. What I didn't realize, right? until later in life was that there is a community of disabled people out there, that we are no longer in isolation, right? That we still need each other. And it is together, by coming together, learning from each other, that we will continue to grow and innovate and evolve. It's often said that people with disabilities are inspirational. I leave you with this thought. In order for inspiration to matter, right? In order for inspiration to be more than mere aspiration, it requires something more. If people tell you that, they, that because of your disability, because of your work with disabled people, they are inspired, the best response that I've found in my life and in my advocacy is great to do what? Inspiration is more than a fuzzy feeling. It's a verb. It requires action. So the question is, what action will you take? Right? In order to matter, inspiration requires perspiration. So will you roll up your sleeves? Right? What is the action you will take? What is the action? you will require or compel or inspire other people to do. And then, by all means, do that. I thank you. I'm going to invite our panelists to join us on stage, and we're going to have a little bit of a panel discussion, then we'll have time for a Q&A from the audience. This thing on? Is it on? I, I think it's on. on. <laughs> OK, let me um, give introductions, and then we'll start uh, with some questions for our, our panel. You met um, Lauren, so I don't introduce him again. <laughs> Um, all the way down 
on the, on the end, I'd like to introduce uh, Nora Amari. She is the Director of Special Education for the Department for the Ministry of Education in the UAE. She has developed and implemented the first strategic policies and procedures to support the federal law for people with disabilities in public and private schools in the UAE. She has initiated and implemented schools for all to comply with national and international regulations on inclusive education since 2008. She has an extensive educational background in special education, receiving her bachelor's of education in special education from the UAE University and her master's in special education from the University of Pittsburgh in the States. She has collaborated with other UAE officials on the response to the convention reports on disability, attended meetings in Geneva, Switzerland to represent the UAE. She represents the Ministry of Education in many conferences and forums in this area of special education, both home and abroad. And on a personal note, I had a chance to meet her when she came to visit New York City and um, came to our inclusion program and um, two years ago I think we've decided it was two years ago um, next I have to go in order here next to next to Nora is Lauren Huff Williams I want to just give a show of hand um, she leads the ASD nest uh, coaching program and works with schools and districts outside New York City to expand the reach of the ASD nest program the ASD nest program is the largest inclusion program in the United States and I would probably argue the world, but I'm just gonna say in the States. Um, she's currently consulting on the NSF grant ideas, inventing, designing, and engineering on the autism spectrum, which is a collaboration between New York University's Tandon School of Engineering, the Education Development Center, the New York Hall of Science, and three ASD Nest middle schools, which design after-school clubs to foster interest in STEM education and to develop career pathways for students with ASD. She also designs many workshops, is a co-editor of several books, including the ASD Nest Support Model, Model and everyday classroom strategies and practices, as well as several art journal articles as well. Okay, sorry, my notes got messed up. Um, the next to her is Janet Angelisani, who is my co-instructor uh, this J term. She's an assistant professor in the Department of OT at NYU Steinhardt. Her research investigates how the fields of OT, global health, and international development intersect to mediate participation for persons with disabilities. Her current research explores the relationships among local, regional, national, and international forces and factors that influence school violence against children with disabilities in East Africa. Dr. Angela Sani brings a breadth of both clinical and consulting expertise, having worked as a clinician for over 15 years and has provided technical advice to governments, the UN, and international NGOs. Here in the UAE, Janet has a history. She's worked with local government and the UNICEF Gulf Area Office to develop the National Strategy for Children with Disabilities, which includes activities to enhance the capacities of institutions in implementing and monitoring inclusion initiatives for children and youth with disabilities, and which was approved by the cabinet of the UAE in 2017. Stephen Shore. Final introduction is a clinical assistant professor of special education at Adelphi University, as well as adjunct faculty at NYU Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development, where his research focuses on matching best practice in supporting people with autism. Stephen, diagnosed with atypical development and strong autistic tendencies, and too sick for outpatient treatment, he was recommended for institutionalization when he was a young child. However, non-speaking until four, and with much support from his parents, teachers, wife, and others, Stephen is now a renowned professor and international speaker who has spoken about autism in 48 countries across six continents. In addition to working with children uh, and talking about life on the autism spectrum, Stephen is internationally renowned for presentations, consultations, and writings on lifespan issues pertinent to education, relationships, employment, advocacy, and disclosure. His most recent book, College for Students with Disabilities, combines personal stories and research for promoting success in higher education. He's a current board member of Autism Speaks, the Organization for Autism Research. He's President Emeritus of the Asperger Autism Network and Advisory Board Member of the Autism Society. Dr. Shore serves on the boards of the Asperger Syndrome and High Functioning Autism Association, the U.S. Autism and Asperger Association, and I would say probably 50 other autism related organizations. So welcome, I wanna welcome the, the, the panel. Um, to get us started, what I would like you to each uh, think about is, you know, um, Lawrence talks so beautifully about inclusion and inclusion is for everyone and it means everyone, all means all, right? What does inclusion um, mean to you based on your work and your experiences? And Nora, I'm gonna start with you. Um, I think uh, inclusion for us uh, means many things, but the most important thing is to give the chance for uh, people with determination uh, because they really have skills, they really have potential, so 
give them the chance. And first of all, also, they have rights. There is a law for people with determination. Uh, and in the law, there are many uh, rights for them. And one of them is to educate them. So rights and also give them the chance. And the third one is the most important thing. I think um, uh, inclusion is changing the community. So the people with determination can be included in a right way. Um, as uh, uh, Lawrence mentioned today, uh, it's not a medical way. We are going more for uh, social. So in that thinking, we are trying also in the Ministry of Education now to tell our teachers to uh, shift from medical to more uh, social. So think about how you be prepared. So this is also for students here. How the community, how we should be prepared to have people with determination uh, take from them what their potential, their skills, upscale them to the next level. Lauren? Um, I think to, to kind of piggyback on that, one of the biggest things that I think about when I think about inclusion, um, I think about how it's, it's more than acceptance. It's more than awareness. It's even more than understanding. All of that is, is great and all of that is necessary, but there also is, uh, you need to just appreciate and celebrate difference. You know, all too often when we when we see someone, or we 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 feel that someone is different. Um, we focus then on on remediation. We focus then on changing. So you are different from me. So therefore, I need to change you so that you're more like me because I'm typical. I'm normal. Well, there there is no there is no normal. And if we can accept that, we can start to see difference and celebrate difference and find the strengths and tap into those strengths and see that by including individuals with disabilities, we're not only doing what's best for them, we're doing what's best for everyone else in the class as well. Um, this isn't just let's include students with, with determination in, in our schools so that they can get a better education, although that's definitely part of it. It's also so the typically developing students in the class can benefit from learning alongside students who learn differently, who think differently, um, and create an environment where, where this is the norm and this is celebrated. Excellent. You know, and Lawrence showed a bunch of pictures about how everyone benefited from that curb cut. And when we shift that thinking to the classroom environment, the things that we do for students of determination, everyone benefits. You know, everyone benefits from organizational strategies. Everyone benefits from visual supports. If you didn't hear, you know, when you're in the airport, you're watching the, the captions on the, the TV because you can't hear, but you want the information, you know? So these strategies, in addition to the physical um, curb cuts, we have so many sensory, cognitive, visual curb cuts that um, we can make that really help everyone be successful. Okay, Janet, what does inclusion mean to you with your work? Um, so we have a, we know the definition of inclusion, and I think what's important to me in the work that I do is not only thinking about that definition, but then thinking critically of how can we make sure that the inclusion is genuine. So I, when I think of genuine inclusion, I'm thinking about how can we ensure that the values and things that are really important um, to the disabled community are included when we build these systems of inclusion. And I think the number one way to achieve that genuine inclusion is through this idea of an authentic leadership. So persons with disabilities are not just being consulted, not at, around, they're not at the table, but they're actually at the head of the table. Um, and I think, th you know, here within the UAE and particularly having, you know, someone um, like Fatma here to join us and to be one of the leaders in our panels over this workshop. Um, having people who, you know, this is their life mission and who have the expertise and are able to share that expertise and the, with, in conjunction with their life experiences, um, being the next generation of leaders can really lead, I think, to this genuine inclusion. So Stephen, having representation at the table, what is your view of inclusion? Yeah, well, absolutely that representation, meaningful representation. And uh, the ideas that uh, we've talked about today, the idea of moving from awareness to acceptance to appreciation, and where we see both the person with determination as well as everybody else benefiting from the people being together. And I find that as we increase the diversity of people working together, everybody benefits as a whole. 
what we need to avoid is what I call geographical inclusion. So in grade school, I spent my days sitting at the back of the room. I was happy in the back of the room. <laughs> I was happy getting all the books on my favorite subjects, whatever it was, uh, uh, geology, astronomy, uh, weather, cats, whatever it was, <laughs> reading them, taking notes, copying diagrams, reading them over again, eventually putting them away and getting the next set of books. And I think at that time, uh, it actually worked out for me. There was so little known about special education. There was so little known about teaching people who learned differently. So it was probably for better rather than for worse that I was just left to my own devices. <laughs> However, those days are gone. They're long gone. We need to push them away. And we need to have those of us, uh, those of us, um, people with determination uh, up front and center working with everybody else so that we can all build improve today and build a better tomorrow. Um, Stephen and I co-teach a graduate course at NYU on autism and I don't know why I ever taught a course on autism before without you. Um, it was very in I'm sure I did a good job covering the material but the level of collaboration and authenticity of co-creating a graduate level course on autism with him has, has been one of the highlights of my careers as an academic. Any other thoughts on inclusion? You've kind of let us off. Um, I, I guess I would, I would wrap it up to say uh, uh, that inclusion to me really means um, um, the experience um, uh, and the opportunity of doing the things that non-disabled people get to take for granted. You know, um, um, and doing them alongside your non-disabled peers. Um, that, to me, is really what the basis of inclusion is about. It, it's, it's having those same opportunities and having that be seamless. You have a great quote about special needs. Can you say it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it's basically this. It's a reframing or a rethinking, right? Because we often hear the emphasis of the medical model in particular talks about people's special needs, the special needs. And, and um, it occurred to me at one point, what are we asking for? Education, employment, respect, right? Those are basic needs. And so what I say is that a need isn't special if everybody else gets to take those things for granted. They're simply needs. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so you've had many different experiences with inclusion in many different areas of the world. Um, I'm just curious, uh, any thoughts or insight into what you have found to be kind of best practices or you would typify as best practices that you've seen in your work, in your travels, and in your experience? Stephen? Well, uh, I'll highlight just a few. <laughs> uh, there is the Center for uh, People... Uh, with disabilities, people with determination in Peru, where with no funding, they somehow managed to include people of determination in the community in employment, meaningful employment. And that's what's key too. The inclusion has to be meaningful for both the person with determination and the, and the rest of the community. So that's one example. They're, they do great work and people with determination are integral to the community and are being meaningfully employed. If we go over to Japan, there is the Musashino Higashi Gakuen, who for most people is a 2,500 student, regular education, elite, private, expensive, long waiting list school to get into. Uh, if you go there with knowledge of people with determination, you would find that about a third of those students are autistic. And these students get included and got, get taught alongside everybody else with class sizes of about 40. Now, how does that happen? It happens because these students, the expectations are the same for everybody else. And it's a community effort. So if Lawrence is having some difficulty in class, it's not the teacher who's teaching that is supposed to take care of it. That's my responsibility. 
Lawrence, what's happening? Let's go outside and talk about it. Let's sort it out and then come back in when we're ready. So that's another example of amazing inclusion. And then finally, we'll hop over to Russia to an organization called Our Sunny World that was founded by a parent and so often takes a parent of an autistic child. They've got about 350 people over there and their, their, uh, their philosophy is that they take all well-researched approaches, methods, and techniques and provide for what supports the student. Anyone? Nora? Uh, in the last two years, uh, we were visiting um, many countries to explore and see what's going on in inclusion. And I remember we visited Canada uh, in New Brunswick. It is one of the best who wins a UNESCO award, something in inclusion. And we went to the schools and see how the inclusion is happening there. So I remember um, students with autism with uh, very severe cases who came to school and they, each one of them has maybe two assistants. Sometimes they come only for one day, but still it's an inclusion. But what they do is amazing. They work with the family. They have issues with the family. So the schools will work with the family, will work with the teachers. When I ask the teachers how, how you do it, how the, the, sometimes the student even cannot sit down in the class for five minutes. But the good thing that they train all teachers they accept the child, they accept how he is. So it's amazing how if the, the, the child himself, he can only come only for one day. He cannot come more than one day. And what we saw on that day exactly, he just walk through the doors and go out and through again and, and again. And we tell him how it's inclusion. He say, we have a plan for him for maybe more than two years, but this is what he can do now. And we believe that he will improve and, we, he, and he will have more skills in the future. So they believe in him. This is what I want to, they believe in the child and they believe that he, one day, he, they will do it with the family, with the school, and it will be a success story. Wonderful. Similar to the note you got about, thanks for believing in me. You know, that belief is actually really simple if you think about it. Any other thoughts or we can, what do we... I'm going to move on in the interest of time because we want to give you a chance to have questions. Okay, so that's the good news, right? That's the good news. Those are the, those are the good initiatives, good models. Um, what are barriers that you've experienced or what do you think are the real barriers to inclusion? There are a lot of them, I would imagine, um, as you think about your work. But how, what would you identify as the biggest barriers to inclusion? I mean, I, inclusion's hard. Um, inclusion is not something that just happens. Um, I think that it's something that is, it's, it's active and it's something that has to be worked on constantly. And when you put, when you take one step forward in an in inclusive practice and you realize, you know, now we're doing this pretty well, you have to challenge yourself to, to take the next step. You can't just stay in one place. Um, and I think that's something that I see when I talk to schools uh, across the country. Um, the problem is sometimes people don't see having separate classes or having pull-out services as a problem. And they're saying, look, the, the student is happy. The student is learning. The family is happy. What's the problem? Why would, we, why would we do something different when this is working? And so my question for them is always, what does working mean? You know, is this student learning alongside they're typically developing peers. No. So what message does that send to that student? Right? You don't belong here. And what message does that send to the typically developing peers? That student doesn't belong in this class. They're not like us. So I think that something that I, 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 I want us to always kind of think about but is really a barrier is this constant reliance on pull-out services whether that be physically removing the child for a resource room with the best of intentions, right? Or having an assistant 
always be next to that student, um, that separates that student from their typically developing peers. Even if this student is sitting right next to a typically developing peer, when there's another adult who's sitting right next to you, how do you have a natural relationship with, with your peer? Um, and I think that it's a really hard pattern to break. And there are a lot of very well-intentioned, even special ed teachers, who say, but I need... I need time with this student. I need to teach them by themselves. I need to teach them in a separate room. It's the only way she will learn. And that's just not the case. So I think that this is a this is a habit that we need to we need to really break, but it's hard. And if I can build on that. So um, first, I appreciate your um, discussion in terms of what's happening in New Brunswick. That's my home province, and it's a very small <laughs> province in Canada. So that that's wasn't even a setup, I think, was no. it? <laughs> um, but my work doesn't happen in New Brunswick or Canada. Um, the work that I carry out happens in the country of Zambia. So Zambia is a low-middle-income country located in southeastern Africa. And because of the the country ratifying the United Nations Convention on the Rights for Persons with Disabilities, more and more children are going to school. Um, but what we're seeing is because of the fears related with children with disabilities are being put in the schools, but that some of the schools are not necessarily read ready for that. The teachers aren't ready, the space isn't ready. So because of that, um, there's bullying happening in the schools, the children are at greater risk for, for violence occurring at school. So to keep them safe, they're staying at home. And I think this piggybacks on this idea of in terms of if children aren't seen day in, day out, when they're not included, that's just reinforcing the stigma that, um, and, and the negative connotations with disability. So f I think one of the greatest barriers is isolation. And be that isolation from being pulled out, being isolation being kept at home, because that's where they're perceived to be the safest, be it isolation, and then, oh my goodness, you know, they can't come to the beach today with us because it's going to take the whole family twice as long to get out the door. Um, so I think that's a, a big barrier that I've seen is isolation. Anyone else? Nora? If I want to talk about UAE barriers, uh, I think... Um, we, we lack of uh, specialization in special education. Many universities here, uh, they don't have the specialization more in special education. But where is the problem? Not the universities. We, th we thought that students in high school, they don't want to specialize in education. We tried with many um, uh, universities to have uh, specialization in speech therapists, others. Uh, and we distribute many uh, questionnaires with students, and it ends up that they don't want to specialize in education or in special education. So we could not do something with this. But I guarantee you, any students will specialize in special education, they will have a job in Ministry of Education. Because we need, we need people who are specialized in either special education teachers or speech therapists or psychologists. We don't have psychologists either speaking English or both, Arabic and English. So I am really inviting people, students, uh, to study here on a, or abroad in a special education or psychology because we really need those kind of specialization. You're a problem solver. <laughs> Here's the problem. Here's how we fix it. Come help us. <laughs> Any other thoughts on barriers? Well, the environment is one. Yeah. Uh, we need to pay careful attention to the environment. And often what I find is that if we improve the environment for people with determination, then it improves the environment for everybody else as well. And that goes, uh, that ranges from lighting to comfortable environment. Like here, the, uh, the environment is very good uh, in terms of comfort, in terms of space. The sufficient space in the chairs. The chairs are comfortable. The place has good acoustics. Uh, one thing that I find challenging are all these lights. So this is quite a help. Yeah, I would, I would just add that um, one of the things we do at the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, we have a parent training initiative. And that's going on for a number of decades now. And the way that generally works is parents come to us when there's a problem with the school um, uh, and some sort of situation where their child is not getting the education or the parent feels the child isn't getting the ed education that they're guaranteed by law, right? And the thing that we see 
over and over again um, is that those parents don't know where to go. Um, they don't know what the resources are. Um, they're not sure what they can and can't do, and it's very difficult to find that information. I think that's probably true no matter where you are geographically. Um, um, there's also still that sense of stigma and that sense of shame um, that if um, I, I, you know, if my child, let's say, um, is autistic, you know, there are people that may not want to call their child autistic or dyslexic or whatever the thing might be. They won't get the diagnosis because they're worried of the stigma. The child then doesn't get the supports and the services that they require in order to learn, which in turn also sets that child back further. So there's, there, there seems to be sort of, because of that stigma, a lack of, of understanding or a willingness that, that um, these rights, these laws, these protections are there for a reason, but they're only going to work if we advocate for them, if we utilize them. Um, um, and the goal always has to be, you know, what we do with the PTI, the Parent Training Institute at Dredhoff, is we train the parents to be advocates for their children, and the parents in Dredhoff work together to train those children to become their own advocates, to become self-advocates. Because like the story of me falling down, <laughs> and mom saying, are you okay? Okay then, get back up. There are going to be situations as that child grows, as that child becomes an adult, um, um, where mom's not going to be there, where the parent isn't gonna be there. So they have to grow up with an understanding of, of that this is my right um, um, to have an education alongside my peers and be willing to fight for that, right? And, and to instill that kind of sense of um, righteousness almost um, um, with regard to, no, no, this, I'm not putting you out <laughs> this is your job. You're the teacher, right? This is what the school system is supposed to do. Um, um, and then really pushing and fighting for it and making sure that that's um, something that's equitable for all students um, within that classroom, within that system, within that county, within that structure um, um, is, is uh, uh, I think, the biggest barrier. People don't know um, what to do, how to do it, where to find the information, um, um, and where to find their peers. I think one of the best things that one can do for a disabled child um, um, is um, introduce that child to disabled adults um, um, so that that child can have a sense of what possibilities are there for them as they grow up, right? And that, and that life doesn't end um, when you graduate high school, or when you leave high school. Um, those expectations have to be high. If the expectations are high, um, then, then um, basically what the child accomplishes isn't going to be high. Uh, you know, all the things that I sort of ran through with my own personal story, which I don't normally do, um, um, but I felt it was important for this event and, and, and this situation. Um, I did not because I'm an example of American exceptionalism. I'm not, right? What I am is an example of inclusion in action. Right? I grew up at a time, I was fortunate enough to grow up at a time where the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, was law. And it was expected that I would be in a mainstream, what they called a mainstream school, an, a, an inclusive school, and an inclusive setting. That was the standard for me, that I was going to be right there alongside my non-disabled peers, and no one was going to accept anything less than that. And I think it's that kind of willingness to say, not what's the minimum standard that we can get away with? That shouldn't be the bar. The bar should be what's the most that we can accomplish. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so on that note, um, I'm just gonna ask the panelists if they have one, any other final thought about what they would do to um, really, really move, move the needle in their work around inclusion, around society, and all these barriers that you brought up. If you had that one thing that you said, this is what I would focus on. What would that be? And then we'll open it up to questions and answers. Education. Learning about people of determination and looking at people with determination as an expression of the diversity of the human gene pool. I would say listen. You know, listen to the community. Listen to the persons with determination. You know, it doesn't matter how much I work in the space. I am not an expert in the space. So if you want to be including individuals with disabilities, individuals with determination in any setting, 
talk to those individuals, ask them what they need and listen. I would say don't assume that you have to have, you know, a master's of disability studies to do this work, that it's such a cross-cutting issue that everyone in this room in your field um, can, can bring it back. And so as Lawrence, I think you really pointed out well in terms of like reflect on what's your action. And so I would really challenge everyone to do that. Um, I think maybe for us in this stage in UAE, we need uh, more awareness. Uh, people with determination is not something you just say we want to work with them. It, it is more than um, act. So teachers should act. So accept them and l teach them. It's not just uh, we accept them and then the work, somebody will do it. So what we, what we believe now uh, that it's not only uh, we, we are with people with determination, we believe, you just also have to act as a member in the community. Yeah, and, and I would add that, uh, well, if I had one thing I think that I could do, if I could snap yeah, my fingers and make that happen, um, I'd take away separation, segregation, and isolation. I would force students to be together in the same classroom, and I would force the teachers to figure out how to make that work. Um, I would just say separation is not an option. Figure it out. Um, um, you fell down, get back up. You know, I, I think that's probably um, um, what's going to would make the most difference um, in doing it. You know, one of the most amazing things um, about disability that doesn't get, I think, enough attention is that if you're born into a world that wasn't built with you in mind, right? Um, whether you're blind or you're deaf or you have an intellectual disability or you're autistic or you, whatever the situation might be, um, you get really good, really quick at figuring out how to get things done, right? Um, that is a skill set that you develop whether you want to or not. And that's a valuable thing. That's a valuable thing in life. That's a valuable thing in the workplace. Um, but people are never going to develop those skills if they're never given the opportunity to develop those skills. So I think we need to facilitate those situations. And I'll just finish up with saying that, you know, you remind me of, um, when we talk about, you talk about where we are in the UAE. One of the things I think about, because I spend a lot of my time thinking about how a lot of professionals have gotten it wrong in the U.S. Um, we, we spend a lot of time in special education remediating weaknesses. Most of the IEP, most of the interventions is about remediating weaknesses. And none of us in here have built our lives on remediated weaknesses. We don't. We don't build our life on the things we can't do. We build our lives on the things we can do. And we have not done that over the years in the US system of special education. We have not engaged uh, persons of determination at the table, central to the table. So my message would be skip all of our mistakes. Yeah. Don't even learn from them. Don't skip even them all together. Just, Just skip them. Skip right over Go them. Go from the yeah. landline to cell phone right away, <laughs> you know? And, and really centrally include uh, uh, people with determination in every discussion that you have. I wish I would have done that a long time ago as a, as a professional. I wish I would have done that If, a if long somebody time is ago. fascinated with trains, you might have an engineer on your hands, right? Encourage that, foster that. Well, yeah. I want to thank the panel.